Welcome to our Thursday night meeting for uh, September. We're going to talk about operation tonight. And I've got Burr Stewart and uh, Dave Woodrill and Dale Kreutzer. And I'll chat a little bit about my layout and my scheme. And I'm not necessarily interested tonight in talking about specific details of any operating system. But I'd like you guys to talk about why we want to be involved in operations and what are the benefits you get out of it. And then talk about some of the specific things that you do that would help anybody who's not operating at this point. Let's start off with Dave Woodrell. Dave is an SN3 guy up in Bothell. I'm going to share my screen, and uh, Dave's plot plan is uh, its a pretty easy to orient. Uh, this is a stairway coming downstairs, and you, you come into a, a hallway here. If you turn right, there's a kitchen where the bar is and all that, a shop, a workbench, and so on. And then the aisleway comes down. This is Rico. And on the other side of the aisle is Ridgeway. And then around the corner, you come past Placerville. And then on the uh, opposite side of the aisle is Lizard Head. And then at the end of the aisle is Ophir. So those three towns are iconic narrow gauge locations. And then come on around past Lizard Head and into uh, Rico here. And then he punches through the wall to his kitchen area, work, his workshop and so on. Got a little fiddle yard there. Curls on around and goes around through the uh, unfinished crawl space, basically. And then reemerges right here at Ridgeway. So well, Dave, comment on your layout and, and how you operate it, why you're doing what you're doing. Okay, well, first of all, it's essentially finished, has been for about the last three, four years. I continue to modify it a little bit, but I have all this uh, railroad, and it's nice to have the option of doing some operations so that you, you just see a different side of the hobby rather than just building, which I enjoy the most. But it really gives you a good feeling to see that a group of people can come in and once they're familiar with the system, really have a good time moving trains around, just like the prototype does, or in my case did, because this, this railroad went out of business in 1952. It's the Rio Grande Southern. It went from Durango, Colorado, to the uh, west, and then up the western side of the mountain range there to access the mining area in like the Telluride area specifically. And then it connected with the rest of the Rio Grande Western up in Ridgeway. I uh, utilize a Swiss list generating system that was developed and coded by uh, one of our local SN3 fathers, uh, Bruce Hanley. It's uh, fairly simple to understand. It takes a little time to load all the information you have in it uh, that you need to put in it so it will actually operate. But once people are familiar with how things are done, uh, it seems to be very uh, appropriate for my layout. Just to give you a general idea, the longest distance from the bottom of this picture to the top is uh, 33 feet. And it varies from 15 to 18 feet wide. That's uh, the odd shape there down where Ridgeway is because my garage butted up to the right side of it. We usually have, when I do operate, we can use up to eight people and give them individual jobs. Like, uh, sometimes we work as crews, depending on how many people we have. We have an engineer and a conductor, and I just let the crew decide amongst themselves what jobs they want. Give a good description of how the switches work and how the coupling is done and how the uh, I use NCE wireless throttles, how those are operated and started. And all the locomotives have sound in them, so lots of railroad sounds going on when they're working over there. And it's been a, a real interesting extension to my modeling efforts, having this operation capability. The first time I ever even heard of operations was when I was a kid, and on a railroad magazine editors it was a guy by the name of Paul Larson. And he was a, a real forerunner in, in train operations. He built it, and he and a, a few other guys operated. I had no idea what they were talking about. 
Years later, when I got back into the hobby, I was fortunate enough to meet Paul Scholes, and he had a, a very large SN3 layout. And every month he had a, a session there, and I was fortunate enough to get to participate there before I ever had any of that going on in my layout. It was just fascinating. So that kind of got my interest up for you. I guess the bottom line is I feel it gives you a, a way of utilizing and showing off your efforts so after you've gone to all the trouble to build a layout to get to use it and let other people use it with you. So typically, how long is an obsession? Uh, usually about three hours is what mine works out to be. Try and take a break and then about the middle point. Depends on how many trains we run, how many people we have there. But that's generally roughly what I use. Okay. I think Dave said he the Bruce Hanley RR Ops is the is what you're using for your switch list. Correct. He's a brilliant. You guy. got four or five crews. You only have two passing tracks. No three, I guess. Yep. So how do you work that? Is that part of a train or a timetable or? Use a fast clock and generally orient the train so that they, if everything goes smoothly, you have meets at those track at those points. This track plan basically is what it was like actually on the RGS. Now the difference is when you're running an operations section session, you want to run trains. Well, the RGS, especially during the time frame which I model, you know, they might have a train a week. So they really didn't normally have a lot of problem with train meets and having space to do all that. It definitely is impacted here in, the, in this design, though, because uh, sometimes you you have to hold a train in, like, Placerville while another one's coming down over the grade and then meet. Sometimes at the Ofer siding there, you can see in the map. It, it, uh, that I become pretty involved in it. I'm not a, actually the dispatcher, but I have to kind of act like one. It, it, pre it creates some interesting problems, but it's, it works fine. Do you have a timetable, or does, do all the trains start at the same time? Well, then we all start the clock, uh, and everybody's in position, but the trains are staged such that you have enough room on the layout to run them. If you let everybody, like if you had four trains, uh, you'd run into each other, so you, you wouldn't be able to operate. I usually have the morning, or the first half of the session is a train that leaves from Rico going north to Ridgeway and about the same time one will leave from Ridgeway and so there'll be a scheduled meet either in Placerville or the you Ilford know, siding. And there's switching done by each of those trains all the way around the layout. Sometimes they get stuck working a, a difficult situation. Sometimes it works just like clockwork. So but that's all part of the fun. Just like the real railroad, right? Yeah. Especially in narrow gauge. I mean Neural Gauge was not a Class A operation. They were kind of operating as they could. Thank you. That makes it interesting. The uh, other comment I'd make is that the trains in uh, Dave's layout, uh, Dale's and mine, typically are fairly short, like uh, six to uh, 10 cars at the most. Dale tends to run longer trains, and sometimes you'll run doublehead trains. But the, the, they're typically fairly small. So, uh, but even that, uh, you're sometimes challenged to get them past each other and so on. All right. Any other comments or questions of Dave at this point? We'll come back to him uh, when we when we sort of get ready to wind up with a general discussion. So, thank you, Dave. I'm going to uh, stop this share and invite uh, Dale to come on and uh, talk about your operation, Dale. Well, like Dave said, I, I modeled the southern part of the Rio Grande Southern. I picked up a book, one of the Grant books, and, and was just fascinated by it. And it was, I like the wide open spaces. And the southern end had a lot of operational possibilities, a lot of agriculture, and as well as mining, a lot of coal. And, or, and so there was, there was all this possibility. But basically, you know, the layout was, you know, we moved in our house in 93 and, and spent the time planning. Uh, so it was an unfinished uh, basement. And the reason I'm showing you this is back in the day, it was all hand drawing. And this is, this was the, the final concept. And one of the important things I think 
it was you know adding scenery details in the mountainous areas. So this this is a little bit better view of how it is more or less today. And there's only really a few changes. There's an extra siding at Glencoe and another one at Porter. Uh, there's an extra passing siding in Mancos. And all that came about because early on, once the track work was done, I basically built the bench work and then did the roadbed, the track, and started operating probably the earliest was around 2006. And, you know, obviously I was just getting my feet wet. But it allowed me to look at the track plan and say, okay, was this working? Did this work? Maybe this doesn't. And so I was able to make changes before scenery got started. And I also can't emphasize enough of working out all the kinks in your track work. Anyway, so that got started there. And basically, uh, what we have here is this is uh, 42 feet. And this is 16 and a half here. And this is, I guess this, this here is about 11 and a half in this area here. One of the things I want to point out before I go any farther is I really worried when designing this, whether there would be enough to do. You know, like Dave says, the Rio Grande Southern, even back in the 1920s, you were only talking a train, a couple of trains a day, mixed maybe some, a freight or two. And so I really worried about whether it was going to be enough for an operating crew to do. And much to my surprise, when you look at this, you say, well, there's no big yards. Uh, Dolores is probably the biggest, uh, the closest you would call to a yard. And yet it keeps people busy for a good solid four hours. And nobody's complained about not having enough to do. And what I'm trying to emphasize is, is you don't always have to have a lot of track to have satisfying operations. Anyway, you know, this is the Durango area. And we, we go through West Durango and we got to... We start climbing up through Porter, and there's Coal, New Junction. There, you'll notice there's no turntables on the layout. I, I didn't have room for Durango, so, um, but they, the rear guard southern use a lot of uh, Ys. And then, you know, we, we keep heading up the SEMA Summit. SEMA Summit tends to be what limits the train length, unless we double the hill. And then you head downgrade eventually into Mancos here and Glencoe, and then you work your way over to Dolores. Staging is very skimpy. Uh, originally, I thought about having it in this area here, but I lost that argument. But that's okay, because in the end, it ended up being a great spot for the dispatcher's desk. But basically, I run a timetable train order set up. There's uh, telephones throughout the, the layout at the towns. And you see Robin, and he controls the, the movement on the layout. In general, operating the layout, it gives purpose to your layout. That's the way I look at it. it building a layout and not having it run would just doesn't make sense to me. You learn how the prototype works. You know, even if you freelance, everybody looks at a prototype. Well, how do they do this? Why did, and why did they do it? And like I said, during the design phase, you know, add some scenery details to your plan because it helps. You know, one of the things you always got to remember when you're designing a layout is the railroad went around and through the terrain. The railroad wasn't there first. So that's something to always keep in mind. Camaraderie. I really enjoy the fact that, you know, I get to see, you know, my friends and also get to meet new people and having them over to run the, run the layout. And it gives me a lot of pleasure to see the layout come alive, to see it run, see how things work. And so, you know, that's some real, I think, strong points to operating your layout. You know, you, you, you just learn every time. So don't, don't be afraid to just jump in and just get started. Whether you want to use car cards, or a computer system, you know, Dave's using RR Ops. I'm using uh, Ship It. I like it because I, I export the moves and I have my own switch list in Excel and I just drop the moves into Excel. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's pretty much in a nutshell. How many operators at a typical session, Dale? Uh, I like to have a minimum of seven and I generally a uh, maximum of nine. Because I can double up on the freights with an en engineer and a conductor. Typically, we run seven trains, eight. If you count the uh, four main freights, uh, there's the mix, and then there's three locals that do a lot of the switching on the industries. This kind of gives you an idea of what the, the layout's about.
There's, there's still a lot of scenery to do, a lot of details. What how, What is your average aisle width? I've, I've always tried to keep the, um, if it's a narrow place, it's, it's, a, it's a very short, narrow place. You know, something you can just slide in and out real quick. This is almost four feet here, 30 inches, 36. Uh, there's a couple narrow spots. It, it just, it varies because it's an irregular, you know, shape. The, the photo makes it look narrow than it is, but, it, you know, you can see you, can, you just slide right through and you, you go from one wide area to the next very quickly. And if and if there's a place where I think, you know, that something could be damaged, I'll just put up a, a plexiglass or something like that. Is that a step-up bench we see in the foreground there? The... Yeah, so they interlock so they don't slide around. And they can even be stacked. In this case here, Dolores is a little little deeper. It's you know it's about twenty six to twenty seven inches back to the back track here, and you got to reach over buildings. So this gives the operator a little better chance at getting at the cars and hand uncoupling them, and not damaging anything. You know, Dale, one ad one advantage of uh, using computer switchless is you don't have any car card boxes on the front fascia. Right. In fact, that's, this is the photo I was just going to show. Uh, this is what we're currently using. It is a clipboard that is used for, like at a restaurant, to drop off somebody's bill. So I, it's done on both sides. You just flip it over, and it's got a nice little place to put your pencil. But this also shows giving operators the tools they need to be successful. People that come regularly, yeah, they, they kind of know where everything is. But you do get new people, and it really helps to have things like a diagram here. They can just, you know, pick up the bottom and, and look at it, and it shows where the industries are and what they are, because it's not always obvious just looking at the layout. And, of course, you've got the train scheduled uh, here for each station. If it's in bold, you have a meet. And then, of course, I, I got labels. These are just really simple things like it's an Excel sheet. And it's it's printed out, and then I just use the you know those the, the the glue sticks that the kids use in in grade school, and I just put it on that way. And that way, if I ever need to change, it just kind of really pops off. Simple things like um, you know you got your fusies, and of course if it has an OS label, that means you got to call in when you get to the town, and of course you you OS out when you leave. It can get crowded at times, you know, and that's a lesson as well. At the beginning of the, the session, I always ask people now to wait in the uh, operator, the crew lounge, until the dispatcher calls them to run their train. Because what happens is people get their, their switch list and they want to run back and see their train, even though they're not leaving for uh, an hour fast clock time. So we have to manage it. Old switch list, again, it's always changing. And, you know, I don't use these anymore. Something when you're developing operations too, very handy to have is a, you know, a, a schedule graph like this. So you can look and you can plan your, your meets. You got to meet here, you got to meet there. And it's it's very, very useful. Did you start with train orders or did uh, you start yeah. with car carts? No, I started right out with, with Ship It. I like the, what I liked about Ship It is it does the moves based on consignees and suppliers. And so the cars are always moving in different directions. You have a consignee in Durango that, that needs a shipment of beans. And so ship it will send a box car over to Dolores to warehouse number two and they'll ship, you know, it'll load there. And then uh, the next session, it'll it'll be heading toward Durango. So it keeps things moving. And, and it's a personal thing. You know, I just like to see, I, I like to know what the layout is doing. You know, it's like, Running a railroad. So, how are the lists generated manually by yourself? No, by ship it. This is ship it here, and it has a lot of different reports that you can use. Like you know, the starting car locations is always a very important one when you want to make sure your cars are in the right spot. But as you can see here, you know, it tells you what industries is at. Is it empty? In this case, it has hardware, and the total weight of the car is thirty-one tons. That's something I enter in. It's not something that Ship It does. One of the things I like to do, since I make up my own switch list, 
is I can export the switch list out of Shipid. So I do that and I have this pre set up so the fonts and everything stay the same and then I just enter the information out of ship it. When it when it exports it, it looks like this and then you just take and you you copy and paste it in. You know, some people are not going to want to do that. For me, I, I just enjoy doing it. It also helps when we have an operating session. I know pretty much what every train is supposed to be doing. You know, so that, that kind of helps to keep things moving. Which brings up one more subject. If you can, try not to insert yourself into the op session. Because the reason is, is as the owner of the layout, you know, orchestrating the session, you're often needed to go from here to there to, to deal with this little issue or that little issue. And so you don't want to get tied up trying to run a train and then running to the other end of the layout to, to help somebody out. So if, if at all possible, don't run a train yourself. Uh, all right. Burr, uh, Stewart uh, has got a very, very interesting layout. And uh, there's a ton of videos out on it on the YouTube channel. And I commend all of them to you over time to look at them. Uh, Burr, talk about your layout. It's at Burlington Northern. Dale's just said a bunch of things that I agree with and will not say again. Nice bunch of points there. I uh, have given a couple of clinics on this topic and I extracted some of the most important slides from it for tonight just to make it really quick. I kind of see model railroading in these four categories of rail fanning, model building, collecting, and operating. And you can see there's lots of time and money you can spend in all of them, and they're all fun. So, you know, do what you want. Uh, as both of the previous people have said, operations gives your layout a sense of purpose. And the customer part of it is is not, we, we get obsessed with locomotives and track and cars, but what operations allows you to do is get an idea of what who are the customers and how do you serve them, which I, I think is really interesting. And the information that you need in order to operate kind of falls into these categories in this chart. You need a list of plausible on and offline shippers. You need tracks to spot, pick up, and sort cars. And there's definitely a feedback loop. And it's good to start operating early in your layout construction so you can realize you need to move a turnout or something before you ballast it. You need enough throttles if you're going to have eight people uh, running eight trains at the same time. You need waybills or switch lists or something for car routing so you know where the cars are supposed to be picked up and dropped off. Job instructions uh, or train instructions for the trains and some sort of a sequence or schedule for the dispatcher and uh, and the yard masters. So that's a lot of information, but you know, uh, you can start gradually. So I thought I'd just do a couple of conceptual diagram here. So from simple to complex, uh, and you can see all this on lots of YouTube videos that are out there, you can just swap similar car types in and out of trains. You can just drive a train around your layout, and if there's a boxcar in the side in a spur, you just take the boxcar out of your train, pull the one out of the spur, and, and exchange them. And a lot of people really have fun doing that very simple tank car for tank car, box car for box car. And you don't have to have any idea what you're doing other than, you know, the cars that are on the layout need to be exchanged with the ones in your train. You also can do color-coded tabs or sticky dots. I know there's a at least an N-scale modular club that operates here that has used these sticky dots. And different colors uh, represent different towns. And this is a, a bin. I have a, I have a color scheme for the layout. And these little H columns that are made with evergreen styrene, just painted on the different colors on, on the side so I can throw one of these down on a car and no matter what else is supposed to be happening, if it's a red car, it needs to be sent to the south. Um, of course, there's a well-known system of car cards and waybills, uh, which is often abbreviated CC and CW. This is just a picture of one. And of course, with car cards and waybills, you, each car has a car card uh, with a pocket for the waybill that says where it's going to go. And you can flip the waybills around and get different destinations. And they need to accompany the cars. So you need to walk around the layout with a stack of car cards as well as your throttle. Joe Green, among other people, he has car cards and waybills for all his cars, but then he hand writes the switch list for each train based on where the cars are in the train. 
And that makes it very much like a prototypical switch list. It's not coming out of a computer in random order. It's actually a track order that you get given a switch list that he did by hand. And then, of course, finally, as the other people have mentioned, you can use a computer to track cars and print out switch lists. And that's, uh, I, I think of as the most advanced form. And I'll get into some of the comparisons here in a second. Now, different trains and jobs have different needs. So the local yard and industry switchers need switch lists to tell them what to do in their local spot. The yard masters that are keeping track of the whole town need train lineups to understand how they're going to get rid of the cars that are there and what to expect coming in. The train crews that are running trains across the railroad need instructions on where to go and what work to stop for. You know, that's a whole different set of devices, instructions, I guess you call it. The dispatchers and operators need to monitor the flow of traffic, which is called a lineup, if you haven't heard that term, the list of the trains that are coming. And very important for a model railroad, that whoever is functioning as a crew caller needs to keep everyone engaged in something at the operating session. And one of the things I absolutely love about car cards and waybills is that if I have somebody who doesn't have anything to do, I can just grab some random stack of waybills from a from a track and say, look at this. These cars need to be shipped somewhere else. Could you grab an engine over in the engine house and go get these cars and move them? And you can just sort of make up a, a train instruction on the fly. And it's very improvisational in that way. I've been thinking a lot about this car card versus computerized switch list debate, which runs rampant as a hot topic in all model railroad chat rooms. And this is kind of my take on it, which is that with paper car cards and waybills on the layout, all car forwarding data is actually present on the layout in these ugly car card boxes that are in, on the front fascia. Uh, for every track, you have a box, and in that box is a car, all the car cards for any, any cars that happen to be on that track. So th the whole operating scheme is basically there present for anybody to mess with on the front of the layout. Now, on a computerized switch list, all the car forwarding data is stored in the computer. And of course, the owner has to spend a, a lot of time making sure the computer has the right information about what towns are where, and that the current uh, location of the car is correct in the computer so that it can spit out the correct destina next destination for the car. With paper waybills, the people who are running the trains figure out what to do. They figure out whether they need to pick up a car or not based on the information on the waybills, which is quite similar to what a conductor does on a real train because they come into a town and try to figure out, do I need to pull cars here or not? And they don't necessarily get that information up front. Now with a computerized switch list, of course, the computer figures out what work to do. Taking all of that fun and challenge and interest away from the person and essentially spitting out directions to the human operators. Now with paper, at the end of the session, any restaging is a hands-on activity, which I personally enjoy a lot. And you've probably read in magazine articles that a lot of people that use car cards and waybills will have a session in between an operating session where a couple of friends will just come over and help them restage the layout. And they got to play with locomotives and move cars around and, and pick cars up. And eventually they got the railroad stage. But that's a hands-on activity that I've my, my inner child finds very enjoyable. Let's just put it that way. Now, with a computerized switch list, the people simply have to do what the computer tells them. I've had lots of experiences at layout op sessions where I can't understand why I'm doing something and I don't have any way of finding out because I've just been given simply a switch list. The main difference and the main reason that I'm strongly biased in favor of this system and people say, are you ever going to convert to computer? And I go, never. And this is why. And that's because crews can keep their car cards in train order. You know, it's true that you have a stack of car cards to walk around with. But if you want to figure out what's in your train, you just fan the cards out and you look and see which cars need to be in what block in order to go where. If you are working with a computer system, the cars are listed in random order on the switch list. And I can't tell you how hard it is to take a switch list of 10 cars and figure out when they're not in the order they're in the train. So you have to figure out, okay, wait, which car is this in my train? And which siding is it supposed to be spotted on? The information is all there in the switch list. 
But the human process of translating what's on that computer switch list into shoves and pulls with the locomotive, I find really, really challenging. And I think because I'm so used to it, I find it really easy to just put my car cars in train order and do my switching. So anyway, that's my passionate sales pitch for why I prefer car cards. Now, I want to just hit a couple other quick points. One of them is there's a very important organization called OPSIC.org, which is an affiliate of the NMRA, but they have published a big book called the Compendium Model Railroad Operations. It has all kinds of interesting information about this. They also have a great website with a lot of introductory information and a shippers database. So you can go in and find out what shippers were located in what cities at what time and use that for your car cards or or your computer switch list program. So anyway, I just wanted to make sure we mentioned that tonight, that this is a hugely valuable resource. I just love this picture on my layout and 50,000 horsepower in one view. But I I want to um, just quickly take you through pictures of the tools that we're talking about. The first thing is you need a map showing what you're modeling. In this case, I modeled the Burlington Northern and Puget Sound in 1973. And what can you build in one lifetime? Like the other two guys, I started my layout in the early 1990s, and now it's this behemoth crazy thing, which is way, way bigger than one person can handle. Now, making sense of it, I did a color scheme with blue, cold, north, and red, hot, south, and purple, royalty, headquarters, east. And then that way we can remember by color which direction we're trying to ship a car. And then I, put, I have these on the fascia so people can know where they are in a particular town in the color sequence and along the main line. And then, of course, each car has a car card there with a waybill. In this particular picture, you see there are six cars, and there are six cards in this box. I cut off the fact that that box is labeled for that track in that yard. And never mind that it's dual gauge. That's a whole other subject we can talk about some other day. Oh, yeah, here's, here's a good example of uh, how each track has a box with a label on it. And on the right here is one of the big disadvantages of using car cards, which is it makes the front of your layout incredibly ugly. And you have all of these, all this paperwork hanging out and catching on your sleeve and everything else. But on the other hand, if I want to know what's going on, you see this is yard tracks, one, two, three, four, five, six in the Interbay yard in Seattle. I just grab that stack of cards, fan it out, and I can see exactly what's on every track in track order. You know, we make sure it's always in track order, and so we know exactly where to find a car. We don't have to spend 10 minutes figuring out, wait a minute, where is that car? We just fan out the, the car cards, and, we've got, and, we, and we can find it. I have some folding down work surfaces, so when we're having an op session, there's some place to play with the cards, which doesn't keep people from dropping them on the floor, and that is always a problem. And then there's a call board for which jobs are available, you know, we keep that going. And then each uh, train has an instruction sheet. This is an example of the, uh, a train called the train ship uh, that was a high priority reefer train that went up to a car barge in Vancouver that took perishables up to Alaska on a tight schedule. And that, you know, this is an example. If you got that job, you'd pick up the information and, and move that train. This is part of my uh, lineup, but a, a planned sequence or scheduled trains. You can see they have list times there, but it's so chaotic. We just try to run things in order. And then here's a spot for all the uh, throttles and the clipboards. The clipboards contain the um, clearance paperwork, any um, train orders that the train might need and go with the crew. But of course, physical and electrical reliability is really important to having a good operating session. And this is uh, Dave Enger at the dispatcher's desk. Uh, behind his head is a view of the eastbound staging yard. And then this is a view of the southbound staging yard so that the dispatcher has some idea what tracks are available in staging. And then they can use magnets to keep track of where the trains are. Uh, it's not too sophisticated, but it, it works fine. And of course, you need to find people to run the railroad. This is just a typical operating session, I guess, with a bunch of people. This is another good view of all of the car card boxes in the front of the layout. This is the Everett's Bayside yard here. And that's my, my quick and dirty. And my YouTube channel, by the way, is either is called Burr Stewart. So that's all you need to know to find me. Just type that in. 
If we have a, a, another five minutes, I can show a few more slides on the why bother. Uh, yes, please. Enough? Okay, so just quickly, this is sort of why do I think ops are fun? Ops help you understand the prototype. And this is examples where I was up in Everett one day and I saw a grain train with a Conrail locomotive. I'm thinking, what? And, you know, then I, I looked into it and found out that there was a lot of pooled locomotives at that time. And, and sure enough, you know, I'm starting to run all kinds of weird locomotives on my layout because I saw it on the prototype. Another thing I found is ops can really motivate your model building. This is a HON3 combine label kit that I built in college. And I didn't finish it, as you can see. And then I eventually built a, uh, an extension of my narrow gauge uh, empire up to a, a station, a town called Opportunity. And I thought, wow, this is a real opportunity for me to finish this because I don't have a combine in my fleet and I need to get going on building that model. Um, it also focuses your collecting. This is an example. The Columbia River was the business car that was based in Seattle on the Burlington Northern. And, you know, I'm running the Burlington Northern in 1973. I just had to have that car. I'm not going to start collecting business cars as a, as a general rule. But, I mean, this car, we simply have to put this on some of our high-priority freights and be concerned about uh, impressing the top brass. I'm not saying it helps you restrain your collecting. It just helps you focus your collecting. Uh, there's a difference between those two words. And then, of course, the other thing that uh, Dale already mentioned is you, you make great friends by having operating sessions, some of whom you, you would never have met otherwise, and, and, and some of whom are a tremendous amount of help. And I could go into how much the progress of my layout has been done by others in the last five years, but it's really remarkable. I think it was during the pandemic, I was inspired by um, Lance Mintheim to try just building an operating layout with two switches. And this is an end scale operating layout. You can see I'm using the sticky dots on the top of the end scale cars. I just have two switches and three tracks. And I designed a whole a Victoria BC switching layout just with this and the dots. And I, it took me about half an hour. I clocked myself one day to switch out all the cars from an inbound freight that was on the, the lead over to the right and just bring it in and straighten every car out. I mean, I thought I was practically crazy for doing this, but I, I must say I did enjoy that particular half hour. So that's what it's really all about. Um, I also thought I'd just mention some of the downsides. It does involve managing people as well as things and sharing, which if you're not into either of those things, you might not like it. Um, it does take time to prepare for repair and restage the railroad between operating sessions. And it's also true where well, you could be rail fanning, or model building and collecting. And so this time you're spending on operating is taking away from those other three things, not to mention the rest of your life. If you don't enjoy running or watching trains all that much, it's a real waste of time. I've already talked about resources and OPSIG. I think I'll, I'll call it quits right there. Okay, anybody uh, got a comment or questions of any one of these guys? I'd like to make a comment about the computer-generated switch list because I, I don't feel like the operators are turned into mindless drones so controlled by AI or something from the computer. I'll just talk about the Rio Grande Southern. When the superintendent and the dispatcher at Ridgeway, they knew exactly every car that had to be picked up at every station because they had to plan the motive power. So the stations would call in with the requirements. You know, it, it wouldn't be up to the conductor to get down there and decide which cars to pick up and drop off. He would get down there, the agent. There may be some changes, but basically, you know, what he was leaving the station with, your dispatcher knew in advance what kind of power he needed, you know, for that consist. So it, you really have to think about a computer I generated switch list it's doing that function. And let me let me show you my screen real quick, you know, just so you can see. So for example, here's here's the switch list that we use. And as you can see, it it yes, it does lay out what has to be done. In this case, it's the Manko's turn. And he's got three cars at the Bauer Hay warehouse that need to be picked up and put on the house track for the, the through freight to pick up whether it's going to Dolores, uh, Rico, or, or Durango. 
So yes, it does lay out what needs to be done, but it doesn't do the switching for them. And like I said, I, I enjoy the fact also that with, say, for example, shipping, the size of the trains differ from session to session. And I found sometimes with car cars, every train has to leave town with seven cars every time. And I don't feel like that's necessarily realistic. But it really, you know, in the end, it boils down to whatever you're comfortable using. It's fun either way. They have their good points and they have their drawbacks. You know, like one of the drawbacks of, of the computer generated one is it's, it's a bit choreographed in the standpoint that you want to have operators to run all the trains that's been planned to run. Or car cards, you don't necessarily have to do that. You know, think of the, the software as that superintendent and dispatcher, you know, management putting together what has to be run on the railroad that day. Something that also gets discussed a lot in chats is if you have a complicated layout, you don't necessarily want to play with trains in between operating sessions because you don't want to mess up the, the system, right? Mm -hmm. One of the advantages of having a color scheme is that I, I realized that I could buy paper clips that were in like eight different colors. And then I could just go down to the railroad and put clips on some random 20 cars in different places on the layout. I get an engine and I could just go down and switch out those cars and the color on the paper clips would tell me where I was supposed to be sending that car. And it didn't affect the overall operating system because when I got done with what I was doing, those cars were simply in a different place than they had been before, but their waybills were still telling which mm -hmm. you know town they were supposed to go to. So that's another thing. Uh, in addition to those little tabs, you can use paper clips on a car card and do like a temporary operation. A friend comes over and you want to run trains for 20 minutes. It doesn't have to mess up your system. Okay, any other uh, observations or questions uh, from any of you for anybody? I figured out years ago, well, finally I said, why am I building? Because I've built a bunch of railroads, as I've told people, and they all kind of do the same thing. And when people come over, some people are not totally happy with the way I'm doing it. Some people don't even want to run the train. They just want to look at it. So I just had to say, why am I doing this? And I said, well, I love to look at them. I like to play with them. I know I'm playing with them. These things are only this big. I'm playing with them. I like looking at them. I like the puzzle side of it. And then I look, I've been to a lot of operating sessions where people had a guy in the back room dispatching headphones, all this kind of stuff, running everything on schedule. And although I enjoyed running their trains, that wasn't me. So it's not a question of right or wrong. It's a question of deciding what you like to do. And what I like to do is play with trains, switch, get them running, have puzzles. And I like when somebody drops in for me to hand them a throttle and car cards. And, and my trains have always been like five, six cars, no 20 car trains. That just confuses my mind. And I say, here, run the train. And it's real easy for them to figure out. And they suddenly realize, Oh, wait a minute. There's too many cars for that society. What are we going to do? It becomes a neat little puzzle. If they don't like doing that, they're not going to enjoy what I'm doing. But I had yeah. to figure out what I wanted to do, yeah. not what everybody else wanted to do. And I have tried three different switch list programs produced by computers. I got them all working because I can run computers, but it just wasn't me. So between sessions, I look around and I make sure that everything has gone into boxes that are reasonable, that the car is where it needs to be. I may move a car. I may promote something because I say, hey, this will get a little bit more complicated if I move this car over here. And next time somebody comes in here, they're going to have a nightmare when they try and get through here. And so you see, to me, it's a game. I know that that's not prototypical. I'm not interested in the prototype. I like the prototype, but I don't want to build it. Any other comments? All right. Well, I think we probably exhausted our uh, topics here tonight. See you guys. Take care. Bye.